Great to see everybody. Yes, so good to see you. We're going to dive right in. I'm Susan. Yes, and I'm Kelly. And this is Megan up in the corner. Megan is our operations manager. She'll be manning the chat. So if you have questions or need to you know, clarify something or have a request, please write it in the chat because she'll be controlling that. She'll also be welcoming... Um, no, that's another thing. That's another day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> she'll be also inviting you to ask questions at the end if you have any, because we do allow a good 15 minutes at the end to just, and if your questions are unrelated to what we did today, that's fine too. We're really open, open to hearing what you have to say. Yeah. So and gonna, it's your choice if you want to have your camera on or off. Um, we'd love to see your faces that just, you know, this is the thing about the virtual world. Um, this is how we're meeting and hanging out. If we were live and in person, we would get to see all of you, but um, it's entirely up to you and there's no pressure either way. For sure. So we're going to share our screen and take you through some slides. And the slides are really mostly just to keep us on track. On track. Yes. Um, so you're here today for a workshop called Stop Defending Your Career Break and Stop Pitching It. We want to start, take you- Start pitching it. What did I say? Stop? Stop. <laughs> That's not good. Start pitching it because we want you to go in on the offensive, not on the defensive. We, we never do our best work when we're walking in with a shield. And it's really important that you all really understand that there is so much value in that career break. And we really want you to walk away from this webinar today feeling that and understanding mm -hmm. the value that you have created in your time away from work. Okay, there we go. <laughs> a little bit about us. We are both moms of four who took career breaks. So we, we get it. And we both successfully returned to work. Yes. And we have a combined 40 plus years. <laughs> That's that sounds combined. Funny. So old, right? Yeah. Um, 40 years of experience helping women navigate work and life transitions. And we're widely recognized experts in this particular field. Mm -hmm. We also have a, a really between the two of us, a really beautiful 360 degree perspective of the whole process, but very valuable to you, especially in light of this particular topic is we have recruiting and hiring manager and executive experience. And that's important. So when we're talking to you, we're talking to you through the voice of someone who's actually been on the other side of a hiring of a hiring desk. Yeah. And with our help, we have had clients and students from across the globe now um, mm -hmm. consistently land jobs after career breaks. So we're hoping that today's webinar will help all of you too. So the things we're going to do today, we're first going to call out the mindsets that keep you on the defensive about your career break, that keep you feeling like you have to either apologize for it or gloss over it. Right. We're going to help you reframe that break and spotlight what we call the valuable workplace currency that you've developed and perfected during it. Right. And then we're going to give you some examples of how you can script um, your pitch so you can pitch your career break yep. um, from now on going forward. And then we're going to share some stories of how other career relaunchers successfully pitched their career breaks. And so maybe you can see some of who you are in mm -hmm. these students that we've had. And if nothing else, Whenever we go through any challenge, which, whether it be personal or professional, if we can see someone who's overcome that same challenge on the other yeah. end of it, that gets us through. Yeah, we know inspiring. the power of that. Sure. So why you defend your career break? Right. Three yeah. reasons. Yeah. So this is kind of like that underlying what is motivating you to feel on the defense about your career break. Um, number one is shame. You might feel ashamed that, you know, um, I took so much time off and you feel embarrassed and think, you know, should or like what, what I should have done or what I could have done. Um, and that is a real feeling that we have seen in um, and our students have shared with us mm -hmm. over the years. I Both of us had our own versions of mm -hmm. that when we returned. So if you are feeling that way, we see you and we hear you and we hope that we're going to give you something today to start think diff thinking differently mm -hmm. about that. There's also insecurity. You aren't confident, even if you're able to say, okay, well, I did this and I did that and I did that. You're not confident that the work that you did even has any value. So you can say, yeah, these are all the things that I did, but you don't even believe that they're valuable. Mm -hmm. That's a really big problem because then the third one is you're not sure that the others are going to believe that it's valuable. Well, let me tell you something right now. If you don't believe it, you're never going to convince me. Yeah. So that combination of the shame, the insecurity, the wariness are going to be what may keep you in that defensive mindset, right? Yeah, and I think, you know, we have to um, really find that place in us that is going to believe it. And we see that, you know, when we when we look at our clients and we look at our students and we see when that 
that flip Mm -hmm. of the switch happens and they start to believe it themselves. Everything that comes out of their mouth is sounds totally different. And what it does ultimately, it's so much bigger than just that it's, they start be becoming the, these like people on the path that are forging for all of the women that are behind them that Mm -hmm. don't believe it. And they're pitching it to hiring managers and they're landing jobs and they're, and then they're becoming hiring managers and bringing more of you in. Exactly. So it's a big picture thing Mm -hmm. as well. So here are some common career break mindsets. There are many of them. These four are very common. That we see. And yeah. they're very defeatist voices. And we want you to today just silence them. And, and you need to trust that we've been doing this for a long time. So we're not just saying this because it sounds good. We're saying this because we know it works. Yeah. So number one, the mindset that we often hear is um, it wasn't paid. So it really doesn't count. And you're wrong. And it does you've developed really valuable skills and accrued valuable experiences during your break. And we call this workplace currency. We're going to talk more about that in a little bit. Another common one is I worked a family gig or I worked for my sister or I worked for my neighbor. So it doesn't count. Who cares where you did it? And yes, it does count. It doesn't matter where, when, or for how long or how long ago you did something. It matters that you did it. And that really is important for you to internalize because your best experience for the job you might want might be from 19 years ago. Yeah. You did it then. It doesn't take it away. Yeah. Caregiving work never counts. Actually, yes, sometimes it does. And it's extremely valuable, particularly if you were doing caregiving work that secured programs, resources, or built awareness that benefited others. And we're going to talk more about Mm -hmm. that um, in the next slide. Um, Unpaid advocacy work doesn't count. So you might be advocating a healthcare advocate or an advocate for someone with mental illness or whatever. Actually, sometimes those things really do count. And again, if what you've done has advocated or or, or smoothed the way for others, it counts even more, okay? So now that we know all of that, yeah, (laughs) all of the things that that are getting in our way, things are the things that get in our way. Um, We have to understand and accept these two things, Mm -hmm. right? So So the first one is no hiring manager or recruiter or even a networking connection is going to pitch your career break for you. Responsibility is yours. And if you don't take it on, you'll never get hired. So about 28, 20, 30 years ago, I was a manager in tech. I was a young manager in tech. And I was interviewing a woman who had already made it through all the levels of, of pr- preceding me. So it was kind of just a check mark interview. Like, do I like her? Is she a good fit? She had already made it through all the technical um, evaluations. Um, and her name was Nancy. And the first thing I saw when I looked at her resume was kind of this big empty space at the top. She hadn't worked in, I think, eight or 10 years. Um, and I didn't hire her. I'm not going to go through the whole interview, but I didn't hire her from the minute I saw that I never hired her. And I'm ashamed, obviously, given the work that I do, that I would ever have completely disregarded someone just because she took time off to raise her children, because as a mother of four, I know the great value in that. But shame on Nancy, too, because Nancy didn't educate me. So there's a very good chance that the first interview you have is going to be with someone very young who's not a parent, who's not a caregiver, and who has never taken a career break. So don't expect them to value what you do. You have to own it. You have to tell it. They're not going to do it for you. Yeah. And no one else should, because there is something really powerful when you take a hold of what your story is and you go out into the world and you educate people about who you are and the impact you can make and the experience that you bring to the table. We need to hear the story and we need to hear it from you because all that you have done and all that you've invested your time in during this career break, it is something that benefits the workplace, but you yourself have to tell that story. And it's a really powerful thing. And we see this all the time. It's like part of why we love our jobs so so much because we see women telling their story with such confidence and explaining that career gap and pitching that career gap and using it to leverage. And getting hired. Yes. Not only because of what they did before, but because of what they did during those years off caring for family. So this is my favorite Susan. This is one. Yeah, there are a few. This, This is a good one. Yeah. 
Say no, it. okay. Oh, I'll get to say it. It. Say okay. So work is work, whether it is paid or unpaid. So go ahead. Please remember that. It's a very simple line. The new skills and experiences that you gain during your career break are that valuable workplace currency. And so are the business skills that you had before that you're now refreshing and updating and perfecting during your career break. So if you were, um, you know, an audit manager in your last job, and now you're working on the PTO, you're still using those skills. And there's a good chance that things like QuickBooks weren't available, weren't, weren't widely used. Um, and maybe you weren't really advanced in Excel, but now as a volunteer, you're building those skills, right? And the results in, that you achieve and the accomplishments you accrued in your career break count too. We wanna just kind of get that right in your heads early on. So there are four steps to how you, as Kelly said, kind of script what you're going to say. Yeah, so you're really right? gonna to wanna to pay attention on these next few slides um, and maybe take a screenshot of them if- um, And the recording will be up too, yes, so yeah. you can look at it then too. Yeah. So um, the first place to look at is what have you done as a volunteer? Think about what you've done in your community, in your children's schools, in your place of worship, um, on executive boards in your in your town or organizations mm -hmm. that you belong to. Really think about what you've done and write those things down. And this reframing is training your brain to look at things more in a different way so that then you can communicate it in a more compelling and different way. Think about what you've done as a gig worker. So maybe you've worked for a family business. Maybe your husband or spouse or sister or father own a company and you do work for them for free. Audit the employee manual once a year, do their taxes once a year, contribute to a newsletter. It's not paid, so it doesn't really count. It does count. Nobody needs to know that it was your father, your sister, or your husband. They need to know the work that you did and they don't need to know you weren't paid. Maybe you did a short-term gig for an old colleague. Maybe you even did something barter or pro bono, right? Still counts. Even if you did something, we had one uh, client in our pilot group, Dana, who did a trade show. She'd had about a 14 year career break, but every year mm -hmm. she went to the trade show that her old company did and manned a booth. Mm -hmm. That counts. Nobody needs to know it's once a year. All it said on her resume was that she runs this big tech trade show for her company. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And then you want to look at what you've done as a caregiver. Remember, we talked on the other slide about there being certain um, aspects of caregiving that can be really valuable. These are what we are finding are very valuable and ending up on our resumes of our students. Homeschooling or advocating for special ed services. I mean, we have students who so have many. lobbied on the, you know, at, at the state at capital, the state capital um, to make changes. That is big, important work that mm -hmm. they were doing in their career break. Um, caring for sick or disabled families. <laughs> You are one of those people that has has done that and walked that road. You know all of the different um, daily negotiations that you need to be doing with all of the different agencies and um, and healthcare systems. And then healthcare early. Yeah. And I, I do want to say something here mm -hmm. from the hiring manager perspective. You don't want to put down a homeschool teacher. You don't want to put no. down cared for my mom. There are ways to frame it. And Megan if maybe you could put up a link to the um, tricky. navigating tricky career gaps for any of you that are looking to fill that career break with this, there are some tricks because you can't just go in there boldly and just say it like you'd say it to us. Yeah. So Megan will put that up. If any of you fall into this particular category, um, you'll want to take a look at that. Okay. So the second piece, first you reframe it, then you label it. And you're going to label these skills and experiences you develop to claim that workplace currency. Yeah, so you have to think first about the general things like leadership, like what lead, which of these jobs did I, where was I demonstrating leadership or interpersonal skills or organizing in some way or soliciting and selling. So really start with the general um, lens. Mm -hmm. And the soliciting and selling can take two ways. Obviously, there's, there's the really obvious of I went out and I sold a product or I went out and drew donors in. But it also could be if you were working on a team that was trying to um, lobby for an initiative, maybe you had to lobby the, the public school system for a project or a program you wanted to run. So that kind of is all falls in the selling right. that skill. And then there are the very specific skill sets like financial management. I was a treasurer of this nonprofit. Um, human resources. I sat on the um, hiring committee for the school superintendent. Marketing communications. I write the newsletter and run social media for this, the hockey club. Mm -hmm. Property or facilities management. We have two rental properties and I do everything from GCing the work, negotiating for zoning, 
lobbying, um, marketing for, for renters, et cetera, and event planning, which a lot of our students have, mm -hmm. all right? So that's the label piece. Now we're going to go a little bit deeper and we're going to claim the accomplishments of what you did in each role. Yeah. And so you're going to need like a nice big pad of paper because you're yes. doing a lot of writing. Yes. Okay. So what did you personally accomplish? So here are some examples. You automated the books and payment processes in, you know, any of these, the things, especially PTO. those of you who have been a treasurer yeah. and, you know, you're taking on those roles. Yeah. Created and analyzed a database. That might be something that you were tasked with um, if you were working in- Like that free job that you're doing for your sister's company. Exactly. So conceived of, wrote, and distributed a newsletter. Oftentimes we take on these roles and we think, oh, well, I'll just, I'm just going to do the newsletter. But you are thinking about that newsletter. You are planning the content that's going to You maybe learned newsletter. MailChimp yes. to do it or Constant Contact. And you learned how to, you maybe did a couple of webinars to really learn about good, impactful writing and how to integrate graphics and design and to make, to make a, um, to improve your readership. Yep. Maybe you grew readership. Yep. We'll talk about that next. Um, you lobbied a school district to adopt new e-learning tools. So think about, you know, was there, maybe, maybe your child was struggling and they, they need needed a certain learning system and you spent countless hours I mean, we researching. Had, we did. We actually Casey, had a student. Casey yeah. had a neurodiverse student and she lived in a big city, but she had to leave work because his needs were not being met. And she, I think he's out now. I think he's mm -hmm. out, out yeah. working, but um, she lobbied the school system to invest. I believe it was high five figures, maybe even six in a new platform for other neuro for her son, but also for other neurodiverse students to benefit from long term. And the beauty of that is it began with her doing something for her own child, but then it actually has an impact for mm -hmm. every child that came after her mm -hmm. in a similar situation. So yeah. really important work. And then the last one is you GC'd a private construction project. We, we, kind of talk about it. Yeah, we do say, oh yeah, well, I, yes. I mean, our house burned down and, and I GC'd it. I mean, that's a yes. big job Huge or job. we gutted a rental property and I GC'd it. Yep. Um, I mean, one of our students like had a, you know, a tool belt and she was doing some of the light construction herself. Yeah. And actually she's going into construction. Yes, which is, which really is so great, which is so great. Yeah. So really think about those personal accomplishments when you are in these roles. And then think about the team accomplishments. So sometimes it's harder because the next slide is going to talk about quantifying these things. Sometimes it's harder to quantify a personal accomplishment, mm -hmm. but it's much easier to do it when you zoom out a little bit. So think about what your team accomplished when you were on the PTO and you did that solicitation, that was your activity. Maybe the team grew membership. Maybe you got better participation in an event year over year. Maybe you grew revenue. Maybe you increased efficiency because you moved your, um, your donation platform from checks in an envelope to PayPal or to using Stripe or some other app. Um, maybe you met some very aggressive performance targets for a nonprofit, you know? Um, and let's just all, for those yeah. of you who have done this volunteer work, I mean, there is, you know, hard work that goes mm -hmm. into with not great resources when you are doing these volunteer yeah. positions. So every yeah. target might be aggressive. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. It's so true. Um, and maybe whatever the project was, you, you completed it under schedule, under or head of schedule, under budget exceeding expectations. And then think about the impact. What was the final result? So we got, let's say, let's take one of these examples. Let's say you grew um, membership and your donors and you grew revenue. What does that end up looking like? Well, it ends up looking like more money for programming. Maybe it means more computers in the school. Maybe it means the ability to hire another teacher. Um, maybe it's just that you have better engagement with your audience or grown membership. So you have more participation, more potential for revenue. Or if your engagement is for your place of worship, maybe you're just growing that community, community mm -hmm. growth. Um, community growth is actually a job right now. So there are a lot of ways that those things can help, can count. And then you want to quantify, and this can be harder and you want to use both scale and context to do that. Yeah. Okay. And so you're going to do your best to align each accomplishment. So each accomplishment made with a metrics. So a metric. Um, consider all measurable, quantifiable results, including tickets sold, revenue raised, donors that were engaged if in any of those volunteer positions, money saved, resources reduced, the number of processes that you streamlined, 
the number of people recruited, trained, and managed. This is really like just using these bullets when you're thinking about each and every one of those accomplishments that you've had mm -hmm. can be really helpful. And talk to people that you worked with on these committees yep. and um, in, in these volunteers. Because sometimes you forget that you what you forget. did. Yes, absolutely. You forget. Because we get a lot going I, on. I know. <laughs> You want to use the most compelling measurements. So for example, if you were on the PTO board and you raised $8,000, you don't want to put that on your resume because nobody cares. $8,000 is petty change in the corporate world, in most, even in small companies. But you can look at year over year growth. Maybe last year, that same event only raised $6,000. So you grew revenue by 33% or whatever that would be. Um, that kind of looking at it in the more, more flattering way. Maybe instead of looking at... Um, the numbers of participants, which again, might be 40 participants, look at year over year growth. That's one way to do it. Another thing to consider is the language that you're using. So if you're working for Cherry Brook Elementary School, and that's where you're doing most of your work, rather than saying the name of the school, which almost all, I mean, my kids went to Roaring Brook Elementary School, the next town over is Tooten Hills Elementary School. That language doesn't really belong in your story, on your resume, on your LinkedIn. So instead use the umbrella of the school system, Chicago Public Schools. That's technically where you did the work, right? It's not lying, it's just kind of once removed. And you wanna pitch it all boldly and confidently. As Kelly said, this isn't an instant process. That confidence, that boldness comes over time. Well, and it also goes, it feeds that ability to tell your story because with each of these things that you are picking apart and you are quantifying, you are actually giving yourself the language that you need to be able to pitch it to people with that confidence and right. tell your story in a way that is compelling. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so here, here's how three yeah. relaunches who went through our, our program did it. Yes. So and tell, let's, okay. So we, why don't you tell these stories? So okay. Teresa, start with Teresa. So Teresa's from LA. She was a former media finance professional. She'd worked at Disney. That's where she started her career. She worked at Sony music. I mean, she had some really sexy jobs, but she'd been home for 18 years and her work as a community leader was largely in two organizations. One was the junior league. Mm -hmm. Um, and one was Girl Scouts of America. So we're not talking about, she wasn't running a nonprofit. She wasn't, she hadn't developed an app during her. She had done the kind of work that most of us do, yeah. right? While she was raising her daughters. But she pitched that work and it took her a while. She worked really hard at it mm -hmm. as a community leader. It took a little while for her to believe it and then for her to pitch it. And she's now in an FP&A role at Deloitte, making more on, in adjusted dollars than she was when she left 18 years ago. Yeah. All right. Which is really inspiring, mm -hmm. really inspiring. She, and she's also she, an older candidate. Yes. You yeah. Know, she's, she was probably in her mid fifties when mm -hmm. she relaunched. So she, really great story. She went at it mm -hmm. and she really did do the work to build her confidence back mm -hmm. um, and be able to pitch that to the mm -hmm. world. So she taught those people, here is who I am. And this mm -hmm. is why you would want me. Very competitive process too. Yeah. And she's still landed. Yes. Kristen. I love um, Kristen's and Kristen was also in California, she was in San Francisco, San Francisco Bay Area, but she was a trailing spouse whose husband worked in the petroleum industry and they moved. We have a lot of military spouses. We have a whole program for military spouses. That's good for those of you who may be yes. military to know. And they have this problem where they move every two years. Kristen had the same problem because working in petroleum, her husband was all, all on multiple world. continents. Mm -hmm. So she knew early on that she was gonna have to just take a break. And her break was 14 years long while she raised her kids. And she, during that time, she's a writer. She had worked in corporate communications. She had done some interesting work. But I, I want you to know what the work was because on her resume and her LinkedIn, it looks great. But when we peel it back, she was the editor of a children's book that her sister wrote. She was, she created a literacy program for a school system where her kids went. It was her kid's school. And what was the third one that she had on there? Um, oh, she had written marketing materials for a couple of rental properties because two of the properties that they owned as they were moving every two years, they kept. And so she was doing, she wrote the marketing brochures. She did the, um, you know, all the contracts and all, I mean, really it was not a lot, but it was enough for her to land a job at George Washington while she was still, which is in DC, while she was still living in, in San Francisco and she was afraid to tell them. And they let her work remotely until she moved to DC, where she was, where she was ultimately going. So she is a senior person in the communications department for donor relations at George Washington University. Yeah. 
And then Renata, we have to tell Renata's Renata. story. Yeah. Renata had the added challenge of not only having been at home as an eight year caregiver, but she also was an expat who had moved here to Houston from Brazil, where she had had all of her work experience um, with her husband. And so she had eight year gap, no experience in the US. Um, and she was also looking to pivot. She's trained as a chemical engineer. She had moved from chemical engineering, kind of the design piece to the product um, manager piece, which was kind of helping make sure that that concept became a reality. But she wanted to get into more of the marketing side. She wanted to get into brand management. So even though she had an eight year break and no US experience and she was pivoting, she succeeded into getting to Bar Barcel brands and she was working in the Takis chip line. And just recently, she was recruited out of there to a bigger global brand, I think in the dairy industry, um, in just maybe two years. Two years, yeah. Okay. Yeah, she has a great story. So you can do it too. Yeah, absolutely. And we have lots more stories like that. Yeah. So we have to talk about the language. We have to talk about three words that you never, never say ever when say. you are pitching your career brand. or actually anything. Yes. I mean, we, we tend to use these words way too frequently. Yes. Yes. But we, we want to encourage you to just eliminate these from your vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And the first word is little, it was a little part-time job, no big deal. So this was spoken by someone who during her break was working very part-time as a CFO at a startup that grew 450% under her financial leadership. So it wasn't little, little, nothing little. Don't we're, we're getting rid of that. Okay. And then here's the next one. I just said, just and little. I know. So just, it was just a volunteer position at a local hospital. This is spoken by someone who ran the annual gala, the capital campaign gala for Sloan Kettering. Mm -hmm. There's nothing just about it. No, absolutely not. And the last one is, but yes, I worked that big case, but it was so long ago. Mm -hmm. And this was spoken by a woman who led and won the the um the case for the Central Park Five. Yeah, it wasn't Rodney King, it was yeah. Central Park Five. So she was on that team that defended these four, these five kids that were wrongly accused. Everybody knows that case. And she said, yeah, she acknowledged it because she has it on resume, but it was so long ago. Yeah. It doesn't matter. And the reality is it doesn't matter. You did that work. It doesn't mm -hmm. just disappear. It is still there. So those three words, little Justin Butt, take them out. We're done. We're done. No more. So this is another important message. We started out by talking about, you need to just internalize this message that I'm the only one that can tell my story. But we never, we're always surprised at how, how, how surprised our, our students and our, our mem members of our communities and our audiences are when they hear this. Career breaks are so ubiquitous in the US, 43% of all professional women will take a career break to care for their family and a career break of more than two years. That's almost half of all the women that you see out in the workplace, they may not have done it yet, or they may have done it a long time ago, but this is a common experience. And these career breaks benefit everyone, including the person who's interviewing you. So you think about this, and you mentioned this in some of your examples, your volunteer efforts to help equip the schools or the playgrounds, help others, other people's children. They ensure that music programs have instruments and arts programs have easels and paint. They make sure that your local parks are safe and maintained, that the hiking trails are clear and marked, that the school community is engaged, that the playground is safe, and that, chaper that field trips uh, are chaperoned by people like you. Mm -hmm. And so because you do all of this and so much more, others don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. That person interviewing you very likely has kids that are benefiting from someone like you. Mm -hmm. So remember that and maybe even remind them if necessary. Yeah. This is not something you should ever apologize for. Yeah. And so just tucking that mindset of I have allowed and made this world a better place so that this person could go to work every day. Mm -hmm. um, that just kind of like levels the energy. Playing it, field the when, yeah. it really flips the switch in your brain. Like, oh, wait a second. Right. This person, I'm not, I didn't do something I should be ashamed of quite opposite. I did something that they should be proud of, that yes. they should be thanking me for. Yes. Yeah. It takes a while to get there, but it's true. All right. So the three essential messages of any career break story. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. So no matter what your story is, no matter which 
which frame you fall into, whether you were caregiving or um, advocating or doing all of the above. Mm -hmm. These three things always happen. The first part of your story, the way you frame it, the way you set it up is I loved my work. I was really good at it. And it was a sacrifice to leave. But given my alternatives at the time, it was the right decision. And I'm glad I made it. So that's how much space that gets. Mm -hmm. Then the second part is where you start pitching. I tapped into during this time when I was home for 14 years caregiving, I tapped into it and actually perfected my professional skills and expertise. And I learned some new ones, right? By doing this work in the community or by providing this caregiving support to my family, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And then the third piece is now you're tying it up in a bow. I'm really excited to bring all of my professional experience from my career, but also this very valuable experience that I've cultivated over the last however many years um, into the workplace at your at your company. Yeah. So I'm excited to be here. Let's chat. Okay. It's that frame. It really helps to have these kind of three points. This is where I start. This is where I end. Yes. Okay. Yes. And this is where we end. Yes. This is where we end because we would love to hear um, um, any questions yeah. that you have. And um, you can just learn a little bit more about us. And yeah, um, but also let's just also say this too, that um, you can connect with us. We're on all social media platforms. We're very active on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, so find us, you know, follow us. YouTube. We are on YouTube. We offer free content every Monday and it's just, it's short, but we'll take one little topic and we'll dive into it and we'll give you instructions. Sometimes we even have freebies to give afterwards that you can, you can use to kind of work through your story. Um, and if you're feeling like you need more help, you know, if you're the kind of person who comes to every one thing that we do for free and you're still not working, you might want to consider learning more about our career relaunch program. And you can do that next week and you'll get an email about that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's stop, stop the share, share. Right there. And let's, um, let's hear from you. Do we have any, uh, Megan, you've probably been looking at the chat. So tell us if there's anything we need to know. We have some questions that were submitted in advance. If you want okay. me to, yeah. um, yeah. we'll start with Gia Jaya. She posted a question to start. Um, I'm going to paste it again here so you can see it. Okay. Great. So how do you get sure. noticed by the recruiters when an employee, when you have an employment gap also working on a career change, is that realistic to make changes? Well, yeah, you saw the example from Renata. She made a change. I would say, I don't know, what would you say? Maybe 40% of our students are making a change. Oh yeah. Maybe Especially post-pandemic. Right. We have, we have, we're just seeing every I think cohort. it just kind of made a big value shift. Yeah. So I, but you bring up a really good question. We've talked about this a lot on other, you know, on YouTube and on other webinars. Um, if you're trying to get noticed by a recruiter, it depends on how you're trying to get noticed by the recruiter. Right. If you're trying to get noticed by the recruiter by applying online, it's never going to work. Mm -hmm. But you're in good company because only 20% of Americans get their jobs by exclusively applying online. And if you take out the computer programmers and the application developers whose skills and experience can be easily reduced to an on-off switch, then it's probably you know less than 10%. So if you're trying to reach people that way, stop because it's never going to work. But if you're having conversations with people, it's not a big deal. I mean, 90% of our students are, have a job within a year of graduating from our program, 60% within three months. So mm -hmm. it works and they have long gaps. They have nothing different than probably any of you here. Okay. Um, and it's okay. The next one's from Michelle. Is it ever okay to mention a medical event you had if you can highlight how you overcame it in part due to your advocacy and skills? Yeah. So this is this is that freebie that we gave. Right. You're going to want to download that, Michelle. That tricky gaps because it's yeah. very... I mean, when, I, when we were writing that script, it's it's extremely precise on how how much you say. You handle that. And you have to come at the superhero. So yes, it's perfectly fine to bring it up, but there is very little space given to explaining the details of the illness or the, the um, injury, and then a lot of space on the back end. So it could be something as simple as, it's not something that belongs on your resume, unless you were caregiving for somebody else. Um, but if, if it was you... You might say something like, actually, during those years, I had a health issue. And, um, you know, I was really fortunate that I had this experience as a lobbyist because I had no fear at all going toe to toe with the insurance provider to make sure that I got the most up to date and current 
medication. Um, and it's great. I'm actually fully healed. And I think that this experience really strengthened my lobbying skills because it's one thing to lobby on behalf of a client when you're expecting to be lobbied. Everybody at the state capitol knows I'm coming, right? But the insurance company doesn't necessarily knew, know that. So it allowed me to test and perfect my skills in a new setting. Okay. And even if you're not a lobbyist, I was just making that up yeah. on the fly. <laughs> but even if you're not a lobbyist, it, negotiating and you know having to advocate it is happening in almost every job across the board. Mm -hmm. So those skills that she's talking about are really valuable. They're they, transferable. They, yeah, they're very transferable. Right. So, but you'll notice I spent if you just measured the time, I spent a lot more time talking about how my experience advanced my candidacy and is going to benefit you than I did about the fact that I was sick. And you know, I think it's worth it's worth mentioning that when you've experienced some big life event, whether it be your own physical health, mental health, or any of the, your family members yeah. and their well-being, there are only a select few people that have earned the right to hear that story. And it's never- it's not the person- Yeah, it's never these with. people that you're interviewing with or you are networking with for a job. It is only reserved, the depths of that are only reserved for those people that really have earned that right in your life, but it can be used like as Susan just gave this example as especially something that, you know, you might, you might feel that like, mm -hmm. oh gosh, I have to explain this away. You don't have to explain this away. You just have to give the high, high, high level, level view of it. Okay. All right. Um, good afternoon. So Beth and I, Beth is here today. Thank okay. you. And then I posted the one that she submitted when she registered. So that's the same question. It says- okay, How to update your resume gap for the employment break and how to break into a new field when all of your experience is in another field. You've got to really dig deep to figure out what you've done before that's transferable. And then you kind of have to have a little come to Jesus meeting. I mean, you may, and, and you only can do this if you've really explored and assessed this career you want to go into. So we have a guide on explore and assess. Basically, it's a process of we're doing research, but mostly talking to people who are in this role that you think you want to move into to find out what do I really need to do this? And don't just talk to one person because that one person might say you need to have this Google, Google certificate, but that may only be the case for that person or that particular company. It's not always the same everywhere. So it's important to make sure that you're also looking at what have I done before that can transfer and what do I absolutely need to know mm -hmm. And maybe learn before I can go into this role. Yeah, and you really, really want to vet that because oftentimes we'll find students that have come to us later mm -hmm. and they've got 900 different certificates and they've spent all sorts of money and, time. and they still don't have a job. And we don't want you to do that. We are strong advocates for really vetting what skills certifications have to be you know, schooling has yep. to be, we just did a YouTube on this, this, you know, yeah, we did. they think it was like it's, a week, or, a week yeah. or so ago. I'm talking specifically about this. Um, we want you to make sure that you are investing your money and your time wisely and when it's necessary and not feeling like you have to do it. Now, sometimes we will have students that say, you know what, I, I want to brush up on, you know, my computer skills or some of my tech skills uh, yep. or whatever. And we, that we really do understand. But they're doing it, it, but they're doing it in an informed way and in they're not just wasting way, time. And they're doing it in a way that's cost effective. So mm -hmm. they might be going on LinkedIn learning or, you know, taking, you know, something through YouTube, but they're yeah. not spending, you know, tons and tons of money um, to do this. They're, it's more of a confidence boost yeah. um, to say, oh, I know how to use all the Google suite, you know, right. different. So I want to continue suite. with Beth though, because because you do, because you also asked her, how do you present it on your resume? I'm a believer in being being very forthright in your profile statement and maybe saying that you're looking to pivot. That's perfectly fair. Letting the person reading the resume know, right? You know, I am a, um, I'm not sure what your background is, but I'm a marketing communications expert with extensive experience in analytics, looking to pivot into data science. Yeah, that's perfectly reasonable. Yeah. Um, but then, of course, providing the backup to show that you can do that work and, and why. Also, when you're doing a pivot, I think it's it's good to set your expectations realistically. If you were work, you were at the senior, senior level in your old field, you're not going to enter at the senior level in a new field. So making sure that you're comfortable with that and, may, and com communicating that as well. 
Um, and then there was also an embedded question on how do you present the career break? I mean, we have so much information out there about how to present it, but we believe that you present it as experience. We don't have a separate work experience, gap experience. It's experience. And just like Teresa and Kristen and Renata, the top of their resume was all about the stuff that they'd done as volunteers before they got to the paid experience. Okay. And I know there are people out there that say, just put career break. Career break works great if you took two years off during COVID. If you took 12 years off until your kid got into high school, it does not work. 18 and I'm telling you, as there. someone who didn't hire someone because of that, yeah, that you're ashamed of. That I'm ashamed of. <laughs> yeah, quite. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But that was before I had kids. Yes. But again, the first person you talk to is probably not going to have kids. We had somebody back up here, Megan, before we go yeah. on. Can you share an example of a student of yours that well, took a career break caring for a child? Uh, well, yeah, Renata. Yeah. Yeah. Renata was caring for her three children and it wasn't her parent because her parents were in Brazil, but it was her, her husband's parent. So her husband had a very big job in petroleum global. He traveled a ton. And so she was doing everything. Um, and she's a great example. She, and she pivoted too. Mm -hmm. And what she did was she, well, she took our program and she really worked her network. She got in front of people. She told her story. She didn't have a lot of volunteer experience no, either. She, she only thing she had was stuff she did for the PTO because she had young children and a disabled in-law and a husband who was never home. So, I mean, there are countless. And we have so examples. many stories. I mean, that's all of them pretty yeah, much. Yeah, we have so many stories. Right. So many right. stories. The key is, and you may not have to go back and watch these slides. It's not apologizing. It's focusing on the things that matter. Mm -hmm. And what I'll tell you right now is you might be able to figure it, fill out three pages of experience that talk about all the things that you did using that that four steps that we put in the middle of the presentation, how to reframe and claim and um, quantify and label. But of those three pages, maybe three bullets will make it to your resume. The bar is high for what goes on the resume. We're not putting everything down. So for example, you might've been a volunteer in the library stacking books. That doesn't go on the resume. Mm -hmm. But you were the head of um, grant writing and grant uh, the grant process for- The, the scholarship, the exactly, town scholarship that counts. fund. That counts. Yep. Okay. Um, okay, Mary, um, how to show your career break on your resume? Oh, okay. you just said that one. Already. I did. Okay. So Mary, there are, are, is this, is Mary, is it, are you up here? Are you Mary, the one with your camera on? Because I know, I think- This that was, was a previously submitted question. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure I remember Dara Goddess, because I have a friend who's got a similar name. I thought her name was Mary too. Anyway, this Mary, um, I kind of said it already, but- there are different schools of thought. Personally, we believe that it's going to be obvious. So for me, when my resume was first done, I was run, I worked for a big tech company and I was in a staff leadership role with a huge span of 90 people, right? And then suddenly I'm the president of the booster club and I'm, you know, you know, on the this nonprofit board. It's very clear that something's happened. Mm -hmm. So do we need to put career break? I don't think so. Um, are you wrong for doing it? Not necessarily, but if you're just putting that and not backing it up with the work that you did during that career break, then you're shooting yourself in the foot. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Digital footprint. I care about my information. I shared online. I like to be as low key as possible. How do I, how do I thread share sharing information on platforms like LinkedIn? Okay. Well, I can tell you right now. I mean, I am, a, I'm a Luddite when it comes to social media. I'm not on Facebook. I have a, my name is there, but I'm not on it. I only have it so I can get into our Facebook page. I'm not on Instagram. I'm definitely not on TikTok, but I am on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. LinkedIn is a professional network. It's not a place for people to troll for your personal information. Right. I don't share that. I'm not interested in keeping up with people I haven't talked to in 15 years anyway. Yeah. And I don't, I just, it just for me, it doesn't feel right. So I can probably relate to you. Jaya or Gia. Um, so I think the mental switch that I do, I take is I can't survive in today's workplace without LinkedIn. I can survive today without Facebook. And even sometimes that's hard because I miss things that I wish I knew. But for me, the calculus is I, I barely get enough sleep as it is. I don't have one more thing pulling on my time. But LinkedIn, it's a non-negotiable. So you almost just have to force yourself to get comfortable with it because there isn't an employer on the planet right now, unless you're working in um, maybe education, public school education, K through 12, collegiate's different. Or if you're a clinician who doesn't work at a big hospital, then, but I mean, that's a small, small subset. You have to be on LinkedIn. So just give yourself the excuse that I have no choice 
and and know that it's a professional platform. People aren't posting pictures of their kids on it. And also know that you can use strategies to connect with people in a meaningful way so that you're not just, to, you know, because people will connect with you. I mean, we get, we get, I mean, it's yeah. like, I'm sure my inbox right now has like a number of connections, but I am being very selective with who I'm connecting with. And so you have that ability to put yourself out there, brand yourself in a certain way. So you are going to attract the right people right. because the message that you're putting out. So that's why just pitching yourself um, and knowing the story that you're telling, how you're writing that in your about section on your LinkedIn profile mm -hmm. is really it's, it's speaking to the algorithm. And so, you know, you're, you're going to be getting people that come across your LinkedIn page that might reach out and say, yes, I want to connect with her. And you get to make the determination if that's someone that you want to connect with or not. And you'll learn eventually that networking is the only, you know, if you look at the odds that I just told you, you've got about a 10% chance of getting a job by applying online. Networking is going, how are you going to get your job? Yeah. Right. And that leads to Lori's question. Yes. How do you get around the date aspect of the online application system? You don't mm -hmm. because you're not going to apply that way. You're not going to get a job that way. I mean, it's just, it's, I mean, thousands of people that we've worked with together and I've worked with on my own, maybe one yeah. ever got a job that way. Yeah. All right. Now, a lot of people get it in a complimentary way because very often you might network, um, you know, Beth or Lori, you might have a recruiter reach out to you and say, you know what, or you might meet someone on the sideline and say, oh my gosh, I would love to interview for this job. You still have to apply online. You've got to stick your application in there, but nobody cares because you're already in, you're already at the top of the pile. Um, some people will find a job that's an ideal job and they know that they've got all the tools ready. They've got a great resume. They're prepared to answer tough questions. Their LinkedIn is up to date. They apply online, but then they use that LinkedIn to find someone to help them get their application on the top of the pile. So yeah. it doesn't get rejected. So someone's okay. actually making that move. And also know this, that most companies and corporations now have um, a stipend that is given. It's to a referral employees. bonus. Yes. So if you if I, if Kelly applies online, but I go in and I tell HR, Kelly is a great candidate. I know her. She's a mm -hmm. good person. They're going to hire her. And um, I mean, when they hire her, I get a bonus. I yeah. get, you know, five, sometimes more. Five so when you're more. asking, you don't have to feel like, oh gosh, I'm putting this person out. They can be getting paid mm -hmm. um, for getting your name and your resume at the top. That the also pile. shows you just how onerous the job is for the hiring manager recruiter. I don't want to look at a thousand applications. If somebody comes in and tells me Kelly's nice, I met her once. That's more than I know about the other 999 people. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of those people may not even be humans, bots, provide applic uh, do applications people in prison do applications people from you know other countries that have no skills put in applications i don't want to have to go through all that so if they if i hear that kelly's nice i know she's human i know she's friendly i'm going to interview her <laughs> i'm going to put her at the top of the pile yes okay okay do you want to get the next question there? um do you do what do you do when the you life. lack substantial experience have been rejected because of it how to narrow down education choices since it's getting hard to define which area to get more education on I mean, you've got to do explore and assess. I mean, you really, it's, you shouldn't be picking up different experiences and kind of hoping something sticks. You're the driver of that. And I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. I would say Glossé, but I don't know if it's French. Um, I would say that you, you need to spend the time investing in yourself to figure out what it is you want to do. Yeah. Figure it out. And there are many different ways to look at it. Where do my skills fit best? Where am I most interested? Where do, where do other people say I'm strongest? What do I feel like I'm strongest at? What's going to excite me in the morning? What's realistic? What can I afford? Do I need to work now? In which case I might have to take a job I don't really want, but I've got to put food on the table or do I have the luxury of time where I can invest the time to figure out what I'm going to do. Yeah. But I think you need to stop right now and spend the time to answer those reflective questions to figure out what you're going to do as opposed to, I'm going to try this today. I'm going to try that tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it's really, who are you now? And then what direction do you want to go in? What work do you want to do? And also taking a look at your skills and experience as drivers. So when you're saying you have little right. experience, I just want to challenge that. That might be a story that you're telling yourself. Yeah. There has to be work that you've done that has value. And we really want you to look at that. Um, just slow yourself down and look at it from the perspective of, I have done something yeah. and what is it? Yeah. Um, listing that out and getting that down on paper. And I think it's great that you say you have options 
Um, but at a certain point, the options can be, become the obstacle because you have too many. So really asking those reflective questions because some of them are gonna be easy no's. Like I finding out that this one field that interests you is gonna require you to get um, a two-year college degree, a graduate degree, that might not be something you can do. Maybe you can't afford it. Maybe you need to make money right now. Or this job might be a great job for me, but I really want to work flexibly and I want to work at least partially remote. But this kind of job requires me to be physically present all the time. Yeah. yeah. So, so do the work. Yeah. It's great that you're keeping options open, but at a certain point, you're going to have to narrow them down. Yep. Okay. Yep. Great. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. Thank you, Nicole. Oh, somebody's watching our YouTube. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> thank you, Nicole. Any other questions from anybody? Um, and, and the one person his camera is on, thank you for turning your camera yes. on. We really appreciate that. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. And we, not that we judge anybody who does no. it, but it is nice to yeah. feel like we're not, you know, it's just not hanging out and talking to Megan. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. So Megan, anything you want to add that we might've um, forgotten? Well, we have, um, a couple of questions we didn't have time for, but okay. um, I will forward. Well, to are they in the chat? chat? We'll, we'll, we'll yeah, take, we'll take them because we have take them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to post it. I'll start reading it to you. Okay. Thank you. How can I return to work in a successful, lucrative, sorry, let me post it. In a successful, lucrative and confident manner when all has changed so much, i.e., artificial intelligence, new social expectations, lots of bad news. Mm -hmm. It well, can be overwhelming. Like, yeah. let's, just, let's just start with the fact that it can, it can feel really overwhelming that there has been a lot of change. There has been so much that's gone on even in just this last you know, five years. Um, and when we sit in that mindset, everything does feel impossible and overwhelming. It I, I, a big piece of it is just starting with small little movements, being here today and on this webinar, getting a little bit of a spark yeah. that's like, hey, wait a second. Like there are people out there that are like me and feel the same way. Oh, okay. I can, you know, I can start to think differently about this. So it starts with your mind first, and then you move to the tactics. Then you move to the actual. Well, I, I actually think the other piece of the mindset is realizing that all of these things are changing for everybody who's working too. Everybody. Most yeah. people who are working have no idea about artificial intelligence. They're getting the same negative news that you're getting mm -hmm. every day. So you're not that much different. I wouldn't let that be a roadblock to progressing. If it's getting in your head, then yes, you need to work through the mindsets to try to get out of it. But don't think you're that much different. The, the bottom line is none of us really know what is happening next. There's a great article in this weekend's or this past weekend's New York Times interviewing Sam Altman, who is the owner, uh, the creator of ChatGPT, who started OpenAI and pitched it to Microsoft, who bought it. And you can see it's like the wild, wild west. We don't know. And as a result, jobs are changing. So in some ways, we're at a we're at an advantage now returning to work than more so than we were 15 years ago when things were fairly well laid out and formulaic and where you were expected to kind of get on a rat, the rung of a ladder and climb up. That's just gone. That whole paradigm has shifted to more of a lattice. So the millennials coming in who are now pushing 40 and have been in for a while, they're looking at lots of lateral movement. They're, they're pivoting. They're changing not only companies and not only departments, <laughs> but roles. So that just creates a landscape that's more hospitable to people who are looking to pivot. But those same things, that same uncertainty that you're feeling, who what's her, what was her name? Uh, Anik. Oh, Anik. Okay. Oh, I see it. That same, Hi, Anik. the same uncertainty you're feeling, Anik, is everybody's feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're not that unusual. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and really just paying attention to how you're speaking to yourself mm -hmm. about it. Action builds confidence. So when we sit and we perseverate on something, that is just going to cause more anxiety and stress and around inaction. the whole thing. Exactly. Action causes you to gain confidence over time. So just by being a part of this today, that's going to help you. That's going to help you. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Anything Mike? else, Mike? No, we have an info session next Tuesday. So we from today at 1.30 Eastern. Um, and let's just create just a little bit more color around that. The information session is a, a, a ask a bunch of questions, learn a lot about our career relaunch program, which is a 10 week program. And our spring semester starts around April 21st. Yep. And applications will open, I think, that day, right? The 11th? 
They're actually open this week. Um, oh. And then, but we don't review, you guys don't start reviewing them until after the info okay. set. Okay, yeah. okay, good. If you want to get a head All start, right. go for it. It's yeah. Fine. We just do whatever Megan tells us. That's right. We just show up. <laughs> and when she tells us to do it. That's right. And Megan's actually one of our graduates. Yes. I am. Yeah. 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 So she, she, the dream job. Like, she took the course, she met us, and then she got us to hire her. Yes. So yeah. clearly we needed her. Yes. Um, anyway, thank you, Megan, so much for helping us. Thank you all for showing up. Anybody who's watching the recording, you can reach out to us on social media platforms. If you have any questions about this program that starts um, in, in a few weeks, in about three weeks, uh, please come on the 11th. Just yeah. come and learn more about it or watch the recording. You do have to sign up for that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Right. Thank everyone. Thanks for being here today. Everybody.